a week. The second lecture on Thursday was by Nathanael Bosch um, to complete the section on time series. I therefore am not going to show you feedback. I haven't even looked at it, to be honest, uh, because, uh, well, there's not much point in me discussing what Nathanael did and whether you like what he did or not. Instead, I want to use the time to do a bit of a review of what we've done in the course so far. And the reason for this is the following. So normally, I do a summary lecture at, in the very end of the course, at the very, very last instance, the last time we meet. And that is sort of is natural, of course, to do, because um, by then we have all the content. But I realized that this also means you get the summary about, what, four days before the exam, and that seems a bit short. So if you want to prepare for the exam, you probably want to start slowly now. So maybe now is the right time to do a brief summary. The other advantage of doing it this way is that arguably what we've done so far up to this point of the course is maybe like the most core, the most important stuff that I felt really has to be in a probabilistic machine learning class in 2023. And now what we're going to do from today onwards after this summary that I'll go through now is a bit of a potpourri of different things that we could also have done. And it's not going to be complete. There could be many more things we'll do, we could do, um, but for lack of time, just can't. So I'll point in a few directions, and it'll sometimes be a bit deeper and sometimes a bit shallow and quick. So um, I also don't quite know yet how long that's going to take. So maybe by next Thursday, I still want to use a little bit of time to talk about a few things. So I thought, long story short, now is a good time to do a summary of the structured part. And then we can just see how far we get in the later stuff. So here's a summary. What have we done over the course of this term so far? So this is a class on probabilistic machine learning. And we started with describing what probability actually means. We laid down the rules of probabilistic reasoning. And those involved writing down some axioms by Gamagorov, and then realizing that these axioms, which really just describe that we're going to try and measure volumes of spaces and assign a finite volume to an initial set of hypotheses, and then just track how that finite volume changes if we either transform the variables or if we restrict the space in a particular sense. And endow this restriction with the notion of inference with learning. And that led us to these basically four rules, or three rules and one initial assumption. The initial assumption is that truth is sort of unit. So uh, we assume that there is a statement that is true within our hypothesis space. And then we distribute this finite amount of truth over the entire space. And then manipulate this amount of truth by uh, two rules which tell us, on the one hand, how to get rid of one variable that we might not want to consider. That's the sum rule, which says if you want to know what the probability of one out of many possible values, uh, sorry, one out of many variables under consideration is, then you sum or integrate out the values of all these other variables, and you're left with one probability distribution over this one variable, this one aspect of your problem. And the second one tells us how to not get rid of one variable, but how to use one variable that you might, want to, that you might be able to observe to reason about another one. That's called the product rule. And it just says to compute this object that we actually give a name to and call it a conditional probability distribution, we take the joint, so the probability of both things being true, and divide by the probability of just one of them being true. So we can combine these two rules, basically just plug this into the denominator of this expression, and we're left with base theorem, which everyone has seen before, but now it's properly derived. And this is, we, I argued in lecture one, two, and three, that this is the fundamental mechanism for 
learning, for inference, for reasoning about quantities that you cannot directly observe from observations from data. And that this is a universal mechanism that we can apply across all of science, all of computer science, whenever we encounter data and we'd like to reason about something we can't directly measure or observe, this is the right mechanism to use. We also immediately discovered uh, that there's a problem with it, which is that, which is sort of two problems actually. So the first one is that because of, because this, this paradigm allows us to keep track of many possible alternative hypotheses that might be true, it also forces us to keep track of all of them. It doesn't just allow us to, it also requires us to. And if you have several variables to keep track of, then the complexity of keeping track of all of the possible values they could jointly take grows exponentially with the number of variables that we have. So if each variable, even if each variable only has binary values, if it's either one or zero, then for n variables, we still have two to the n possible encodings that we need to keep, keep track of at the same time. But actually, and that's the second problem, not only do we have this exponential blow up, but also typically we want to keep track of variables that don't have binary values, but that might have continuous values, real numbers, between minus and plus infinity. And of course, there are uncountably infinitely many of those. So uh, that would be in the base of, of, of this exponential complexity, there would already be an infinity. So it's like infinity to the number of, like uncountable infinity to the number of uh, variables we keep track of. And that seems completely useless. In fact, well, it also verily is intractable. So we need mechanisms to phrase this entire process in a tractable fashion. And then the entire rest of the lecture course was about how to find those mechanisms. And we took a sort of a dive down from, uh, through different types of models, different types of descriptions of probability distributions, all the way down to the algorithms we implement on computers, the low level algorithms, the linear algebra itself, to realize this framework, this abstract thing on an actual Turing machine, like the one that we have in front of us. So the first step we took was to say, maybe we need to phrase those probability distributions over continuous variables, or in general continuous variables, in terms of some finite tractable object, some functions we can actually implement on a computer. And this led to this surprisingly, maybe quickly powerful, but also tricky framework called exponential families. So we looked at a type of probability distribution over a potentially continuous variable, x, which can be written in this form. So in particular, this involves something that only depends on x, which is going to be easy to deal with, something that only depends on the parameters of the distribution at the end, and then a mixing term between them in an exponent. So an exponential of a function of x times a bunch of parameters. And the important bit here is, um, and it's a pattern that we got through the entire course, that this is linear in the things that we have to deal with, the parameters. Not the thing that we get to observe or talk about, x, but the thing that we need to describe it, w. And uh, those distributions, they, like all of these terms have names. So this is called the sufficient statistics. This is called the, way, uh, the, the natural parameters. This is called the log partition function. That's the base measure. They all have sort of fancy names. And we discovered that actually probably all of the probability distributions, maybe not all, but the large majority of those probability distributions you have encountered so far in courses on stochastics and statistics and probability and machine learning and so on, they all almost all fit into this framework. The discrete distribution, the multinomial distribution, the Dirichlet distribution, the beta distribution, the Poisson distribution, the Gaussian distribution, the Vichard distribution, the beta and gamma, and so on and so on. They all um, uh, can be written in this particular form. So why is this particular form so useful? Well, because it allows us to translate this abstract object based theorem into 
something you can actually do on a computer through the insight that every exponential family has what we call a conjugate prior. So for every exponential family, and this is, I realize, a complicated slide, so you'll have to look at it a little bit while you prepare for the exam. For every exponential family, there is another exponential family which has the property which looks like this. So we, we constructed like what it's by some kind of algebraic argument what it should look like, which looks like this, and which has the property that when you multiply it with this exponential family, so this is a distribution over x parameterized by w, that's a distribution over w parameterized by some other parameters, alpha and nu. When we multiply these two together, as we have to in Bayes' theorem, then the resulting product is of the same algebraic form as this prior. So it can be written in this form with like, this structure, and we es essentially have to sum up the sufficient statistics of the, well, let's call it likelihood exponential family and account for how many observations we have. And then if we can do that, so this being able to do this boils down to being able to evaluate this function f. So if we know what that function is, the log partition function of the conjugate prior, then we can do everything we want to do with inference, or all the basic operations of inference. We can compute posteriors. We can predict future observations. Um, that's the bit down here. And that's maybe all you need to know, right? So you can reason about what you know about the things, the, the parameters you would like to know, and you can predict next observations or future observations um, in X space. Yeah. So the question is, we could, we could re sort of shift around things, right? So we can uh, decide, for example, to somehow move the, the base measure into the sufficient statistic and add a sufficient a, a weight to the sufficient statistic that is, that is just one. Um, or uh, we can reparameterize the Ws. So we, can, we could have a different set of parameters here. Um, and actually, that's quite common. So for many of these distributions I just mentioned, people use other parameterizations in which W is not, like there's no linear term in the weights, but something else because it's convenient. And now the question is, doesn't this affect this kind of structure? So if there is something else in here, doesn't this lead to a different F here? And the answer is e, sort of, and also sort of not so. So in the sense that, I mean, actually it's probably best if you just try it out yourself. Um, by changing, in particular, the parameterization of w, we end up with a different conjugate prior. So that conjugate prior is going to be parameterized in a different way. But at least asymptotically in the limit of large number of data points, this inference framework will converge to the same point well, to the equivalent point in the new parameter space. So it's not a different description of the generative process of the data. The generative process of the data is, is fixed by the exponential family itself. So if we decide to use those sufficient statistics and a particular base measure, um, no matter where we write that base measure, whether it's outside or in here with a parameter, then that describes how this learning algorithm will behave. But there's also sort of a convenience aspect that maybe under some parameterizations, those integrals will be easier to write down. So in general, actually, they will typically be equally feasible because if you can do them in one parameterization, it, you can do them in another parameterization by a change of variables. So it's not so much that you can't do the integral if you rephrase it. It's more like that it's easier to see what the integral is if you rephrase it in the right way. Um, but, and that's sort of, there's a third point, which actually gets me almost to my next slide. Um, the main challenge with this framework, the main sort of, actually also the power of this whole framework is that it boils down the entire complexity of Bayesian inference, all of it, assuming someone gives you phi, to the problem of figuring out f, the log partition function. 
So back then, I, I showed you some, I realized, maybe quite complicated code that I'm still actually kind of excited about because it shows that this entire process of what you could call classic statistics, you know, you write down some particular exponential family, P of W, and then you realize that you can do cool Bayesian inference with conjugate priors. All of this boils down to effectively two steps. The first one is you choose the sufficient statistics, phi, which is sort of the core part. Well, I mean, phi, and then you need to know log z, right? But so basically, the, 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 the central part is phi, and that bit is describing what you believe about the world. So you, someone comes in, either you or someone else, and says, I believe this data is generated, so data x is generated through a particular distribution that I can parameterize in this way. So by picking a particular choice of w, I can model how the data is distributed. I just don't know what w is. So that's the modeling part. That's where the philo philosophy comes in. And then there is a second step, which is, that, which is like totally mechanical, if you like. So it's, it's, it's fixed once you've written down phi, which is that, well, then you need to know z. Well, maybe you're lucky and you know z. And then you know what the conjugate prior is. It's this thing. And now you're, what you're left with is the, the computational part, is you need to know what f is. So what happened through most of uh, human progress until, I don't know, the early 20th century, or maybe even the late 20th century, is people just staring at the math or in a, on a piece of paper or a blackboard and coming up with a particular pair of phi and f. And that's where all these you know, old white dudes with their fancy distributions come from. Euler and Gauss and Dirichlet and Laplace and what they're all called. They just realize that there's a particular F they can evaluate. And what we have now got in 2023, or maybe or already for a few decades, is these marvelous machines in front of us, which allow us to actually automate this process, make it much more powerful, and do this bit, this computing f, in an approximate fashion. And back then, in the lecture, I introduced for the first time this tool that we kept using since then called the Laplace approximation, which is the idea, and I'm going to get to another slide where I'll show it in more detail, but you already remember, that we linearize this, the logarithm of this expression um, at the mode, so we find the mode that w star that maximizes this distribution, then linearize, or actually not linearized, we do a second order Taylor expansion at the mode, and that gives us a Gaussian approximation to this distribution over W for which we can compute this F in closed form because we happen to know the Gaussian integral. And this is a partial answer. Now I'm coming back to your question. If you change the parameterization, if you choose a different choice of W, that indeed changes what this Taylor approximation is at the mode. And because it's like the last approximation is fundamentally a sort of local, uh, it's just a Taylor expansion in this W space. It's not uh, correctly transformed as a measure. Which Gaussian approximation you get actually changes if you change the parameterization. And if you do the last approximations, then what you believe about W will actually patently change with your parameterization. So if you're not doing an ap approximate thing, then in some sense, how you choose W is doesn't matter. But if you're going to approximate, then it does actually matter. And you could think about good parameterizations for W, maybe even automatically chosen ones, which give really good calibrated Laplace approximations. Incidentally, if anyone is interested in doing a master thesis on this, let me know. Yeah, I have an idea for something to do. So, but now we've already talked about Gaussian distributions, and that's going to be our next step. So we realized that there are all these different exponential families, and they can be used for different purposes. Um, but these purposes, the ones that we find in textbooks at least, tend to be relatively restricted. They're very specific for particular applications. And maybe that's nice, because these exponential families, they almost pr provide like a, like a standard library of distributions. Like in programming languages, right? You, they, Python and the other languages, they come with these standard libraries, C as well, that provide a bunch of functionality that you might want to use, um, uh, like, you know, they, they, like integers and floats and so on. 
And similarly, exponential families provide sort of a base case of Bayesian inference for very basic things, like inferring individual probabilities with the beta distribution, inferring the value of a real number, um, uh, just a single real number or a vector of real numbers through the Gaussian distribution, inferring rates with Poisson distributions, and uh, yeah, and so on. But what we typically want to do these days is something more powerful. We want to learn functions that map from inputs to outputs from data. And we realize that to do that, we have to focus a bit more. If we dive even deeper into the, the hierarchy of how to implement computations on a computer and focus on one particular exponential family, the Gaussian one. Why? Because Gaussians, first of all, are the probability distributions, the exponential families, the base data type for real vectors, for vectors of real numbers. Their conjugate prior, at least for their mean, is the Gaussian distribution itself. So there's a nice kind of closure where we don't have to go further. And most importantly, they actually come with really convenient algebraic properties. So I showed this slide, which I've like waved at a few more times, which is another one of those slides that you really have to look at um, and think about for a while to parse it. Maybe that will show up on your cheat sheets, I guess. Um, which basically summarizes the fact that, or is a mathematical way of, or of, of uh, detailing what I phrased as a simple sentence, namely that Gaussian distributions map Bayesian inference onto linear algebra. So if all the variables we care about in our reasoning process are Gaussian distributed, so if we assign Gaussian probability measures to their values, and their relationships with each other are linear, then, or affine in the most general sense, then all conditional and marginal probability distributions arising from the interaction of these variables, in particular also posteriors and evidences and so on, are all of Gaussian form, that's this big line down here, and the parameters that we need to compute to get this Gaussian form involve only linear algebra operations. So this big fancy line down here of these parameters for these Gaussian distributions, so that's a mean and the covariance for any affine map of x that is constructed from observing linear projections of y. All of these terms in here involve mu multiplications between matrices and other matrices in general, but sometimes also vectors. And then this fancy object in the middle, which we tend to write as an inverse of a matrix, but which actually means we're trying to solve a linear systems of equations. Um, and th those, this process of doing linear algebra, that's something that computers are actually really good at. They are really good at it because this involves summing and multiplying floating point numbers, which these computers are good at. And also, it involves algebraic structures that all of you are really good at because you spent the first at least one semester, maybe two semesters of your course, studying everything there is to know about matrices and their properties and vectors. So we can use this mechanism, which now is really an algorithm that you can implement on a computer, to even learn functions. And we discovered how to do that. We thought about it for quite some time, and then ended up with even more complicated math. So now we are quite deep down already in the computer, thinking about exactly what kind of computations we need to do. Um, but we are not quite at the end of the dive yet. So we realized that we can use this to this mechanism for learning per, a, per, a, well, a set, a vector, no, not, not just a set, but a vector of real valued variables to, in a sort of, maybe not entirely satisfying, but still quite sort of powerful framework to learn functions. Functions that map from an input x to a real valued output y. And we do that by deciding on a particular parameterization of the function. So we choose a function phi, or actually a set of functions phi, which you could call features, um, or transformations, 
which, or maybe even link functions, depending on where you're coming from, which take in an input x and compute a bunch of numbers, which are the evaluations of these phi of x for every individual feature. And then say the function, the value of the function, is the weighted sum over those features, weighted by um, w. And um, we assume that we get to observe this function value with a little bit of Gaussian noise. Why? Because Gaussians are an exponential family whose conjugate prior for the mean is another Gaussian probability distribution. And if we do that, then the resulting posterior distribution over the weights, over these parameters, has, because of the properties of Gaussians, is a Gaussian distribution over the weights with a new mean vector and a new covariance matrix, which are you know, annoying, ex complicated expressions, but they are linear algebra expressions. So they are things we can implement in JAX, in NumPy, um, and just call whatever the numerical library below is to do these computations. And that distribution on the weight space also directly induces a distribution on the function space, on the output of F, by um, another linear projection. So if we evaluate this F at some other X, and we have a posterior over the weights, then we can marginalize out this distribution over the weights and get a distribution on the function space. And we realize, by the way, that we can write these distributions in two different ways. Um, one where there's this matrix involved, you need to invert, which is of size number of weights times number of weights. And another one which involves this matrix which is of size number of data points by number of data points. And it was the first instance where we realized that sometimes we really have to care about, like, for the implementation to, start to structure our computational cost. If we have way more features than data, then it's better to use this form. And if we have way more data than features, it's better to use this form because it saves time. And uh, that already led to our first... So, but, so we played quite a bit with this, right? And I really hope that you... Like, not just got the point of this, but also enjoyed it a little bit, that there's a lot of freedom in how to choose phi. We realized that we can pretty much take any function phi or any set of functions phi coming in, um, acting on x, even discontinuous functions, even unbounded functions, uh, really crazy choices of, of bases, and this framework will just always work. Assuming that we take care to implement the linear algebra correctly so that it can deal with situations in which this matrix, for example, is singular. And we did this. We had this sort of quite elaborate JAX code with this Gaussian uh, uh, data type or class um, which had all these nice functionalities that you want from a Gaussian distribution that it can condition on observations uh, it can project onto other uh, linear maps of the, the variable that it's, that it's representing. It can compute log probability density functions and sample and so on and so on. So this is actually, in some sense, quite a powerful framework. And I hope that you will not leave this, this course thinking, ah, that was just an intermediate step. I should never use that. Actually, this is maybe one of the most important machine learning algorithms out there. I keep being in, like, being in talks, workshops, somewhere, even at big conferences, where someone comes up with a really complicated deep learning uh, procedure. Actually, the thing I was at last, last week, the reason why I couldn't give the talk was one instance of this, where someone gives a really complicated talk. And then I sit there and I think, this could really just be least squares regression, if you really wanted to. So one of the things to keep, like one of the alarm bells to keep at the back of your head is if you go to some presentation, and someone argues that they have some beautiful deep learning solution to some complicated problem, and they don't give clear evidence that this can't be done with simple least squares like this, then maybe you want to try for yourself. Why? Because these algorithms are very easy to implement, they're very easy to control, they're fully understood, it's just linear algebra. Um, they scale well as well if you have finitely many weights, right? If you have like a I don't know, 500 weights here, then this matrix will never be larger than 500 by 500. So it's going to be very fast to use. Um, 
and they produce uncertainty quantification. They have all these beautiful properties. And they, are, they don't require stochastic gradient descent to work. There's no parameters to tune. They are actually a really cool thing, a really cool tool. But we couldn't quite keep ourselves from being content with this, with this model. We stared at this expression for a bit and realized that in these posteriors over the functions, there are all these inner products. There are so many of them that it's almost like it sort of hurts the eye to look at this e equation. There are so many inner products of phi's with sigmas um, that the pattern kind of really jumps into your eye. And uh, this led to a very powerful observation, which is that actually what we need from our code isn't the ability to evaluate the feature functions. It's something more abstract. It's the ability to ev evaluate these inner products. And if you have a piece of code that computes these inner products, no matter how it does that, then we can implement this algorithm. And this hints at a really powerful idea, which is that sometimes you might be able to do these inner products even if there are infinitely many features. Because some sums can be done in closed form even if they have infinitely many terms. And this leads to the idea of a Gaussian process distribution. I'll just show this one slide for it, but of course there are several lectures on it. It's a framework for learning functions that has arguably an infinite amount of freedom so that you can keep learning from one data point after the other. When I say infinite amount of freedom, that's a bit of a dangerous statement to make because in our constructions, in our first pedestrian careful constructions of these covariance functions, these inner products, also known as kernels, we realized that to make this work with actual features, we not only have to increase the number of features to infinity, we also have to decrease the variance of each of the weights towards zero at the same time. And so in some sense, we have an infinite amount of freedom, but also each amount of freedom is infinitely small. So there is some price to pay, but that nevertheless means that these models are in some sense very powerful. In particular, we did a complicated lecture on theory in which I mentioned that these models can potentially learn any function. Any, well not any, but any function within a very large class of functions. For example, with any continuous function, if you just give them enough data points. That doesn't mean that they will learn that function with a good rate. It might take a lot of data, an exponential number of data points to reduce the error, but they are very flexible. They can learn any function. And all we have to do to make this work is this linear algebra that was on the previous slide. So then we said, well, okay, linear algebra, how does this linear algebra actually work? And I realized that at this point, this may have been a bit too much for you. I saw a lot of like, uh, disappointment when I come up with slides like this. But maybe in hindsight, you can appreciate after the exam is over maybe, you can appreciate that this was actually useful. What we did here, I mean, and this is just, again, a placeholder slide, is we really try to di dive as deep as you possibly can in a, in a class with a relatively theoretical uh, approach. So almost all the way to the silicon, not quite the, 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 the chip code, but down through the stack of algorithms to ask what actually happens inside of this linear algebra? What does it actually do? And I think this is very useful and very important to do because we tend to think of these algorithms as uh, sort of primordial. They come from 1974 or so, and they don't have to be questioned. They just do whatever they're supposed to do. But these algorithms, the Cholesky decomposition, eigenvalue decompositions, uh, conjugate gradient, all of these linear algebra tools, they were built for particular purposes. And in particular, they were not generally built for Gaussian process regression. They were built for least squares estimates, for example. And now we realize that these least squares estimates, they're just one half of what we need. The least squares estimate is the posterior mean of the Gaussian process. But there's this other thing, the posterior covariance, that we kind of also want. The quantity that allows us to question the model, to draw from the posterior, to quantify uncertainty, to uh, optimize this model. We'll talk about that in a moment. And so when we opened up those least, these, these uh, tools for least squares, in particular, first the Cholesky decomposition, 
we realized that it's actually possible to understand what these methods do. They contain a big for loop in there, this white thing, that goes through effectively the data set. It iteratively loads views on the data set and then computes the corresponding necessary parts of the kernel gram matrix, the thing that is called K in this code up here. That this thing gets used here and um, constructs basically a view on this matrix. So this K times S should be understood not as just an actual matrix vector product, but an abstract description that says, please compute this number Z, which could be computed in some other way. For example, you might not necessarily actually want to build a matrix K. It might be some code that just computes the entries of K that are necessary. Um, and then, so this is these yellow mustard colored things. This is the process of loading data. Then they do some bookkeeping with this bit. And I say bookkeeping because these are cheap operations. They're just O of linear, like the linear cost in the uh, size of S. Um, in particular, right, like here. And then we can use the, the result of this bookkeeping to actually enrich what the classic linear algebra methods do to actively construct directly the two quantities that we need for Gaussian process inference. An estimate for the inverse of the matrix times the vector y, which is the thing we need to compute the point estimate, the mean, but also an estimate of the inverse of the matrix itself, which is the thing we need to compute the uncertainty. So if we return this blue and greenish thing alongside with a data structure that we sort of remembers how we've actually constructed it, then we have provided everything we need to do full Gaussian process inference. Compute the mean and the covariance and project that mean and covariance out onto arbitrary function evaluations. So this is, these bits are for on the data, on the training data, and the master color thing is for testing, for other points. And if we do that, then we don't actually need linear algebra anymore. This is our linear algebra now. It all boils down to this algorithm, and the main thing to think about is this bit up here. How do I actually load the data? Which bits of the data should I load? The ones that I care about. Well, what does caring about actually mean? In particular, we might want to decide to just go through the data, point, to the data points one by one in an arbitrary order. That's called the Cholesky decomposition. We could go through the data set by computing very informative linear projections that are effectively projections along the eigenvectors of K. This process will be expensive because then the policy requires us to actually figure out what those directions are. But when we do it, this algorithm will converge as fast as it possibly could. It'll have the optimal rate of convergence. So it'll need as few views on the data as possible. This is maybe a way of constructing the most informative data set for this process. And that's called conjugate gradients. This algorithm actually exists. But these are just two points in the algorithmic landscape. And as you move forward after this course into future semesters and the years out there as a machine learning engineer, I am foretelling you that the process of loading data efficiently will be a concern that will come up sooner or later. And for kernel machines, for Gaussian processes, you now know how to think about this. For deep neural networks, arguably no one really knows how to think about it. But there are smart people out there who are beginning to think about it, and maybe you want to be among them as well. So the process that we currently have, where you just randomly load some document from the internet and use that as a training point for your large language model, might not be the smartest thing to do. And I, I'm guessing that in a few years, we'll think about it very, very differently. Maybe based on these insights. So. At that point, we were really deep in the engine room of machine learning, at the very bottom, kind of the stuff that goes into the GPU, um, the algorithms that really do the heavy lifting. And then we sort of pulled back a bit and said, okay, this is deep enough. Now we, like, the next thing down would be, I don't know, the compiler and just-in-time compilation and the assembly or whatever. Like, let's, let's stay away from this. Let's go back out again and think about whether we actually have enough models yet. <laughs> 
Because the, the, what we've constructed at this point is a way to learn functions that map from an arbitrary input x to a real vector y. Vector, so multi-output, but still real vector. And actually, this seems very powerful on the input side. We can take in any x, as long as we can find features that deal with it. So we can build models that map from spaces of graphs and languages and words and proteins and whatever to outputs. But the outputs have to be real valued. And that seems really restrictive. Maybe we want to predict something else. Maybe we want to predict classes or words or proteins or something more structured. Structured output prediction, it used to be called. So we, we started to think about this output problem. And to do that, we went first looked at a particular class of problems, classification, which actually provided a template that more powerfully can be used on pretty much arbitrary data sets. And it boils down to saying we are going to stick with our framework of Gaussian process priors. And um, so we'll assume that there is a latent function f for which we have this prior. But we will change the likelihood. We will say the observation y can be of a general structure. It doesn't have to be a real vector. And we'll deal with the fact that it's not a real vector by inventing some link function sigma that links from the latent function f to whatever the output is, the label is. In particular, if the label is a, is a binary number, plus or minus 1, or 0 or 1, or whatever, left and right, green and yellow, then uh, we can use a sigmoid function as the link function. If it's a multi-class problem, we use the softmax. If it's something more structured, we use something else. For example, if the output is a rate, if it's a number of counts that go from 0 to infinity, we use a, a Poisson distribution if whatever, right? You just come up with your favorite transformation. And this only raises one problem, which is that it breaks this beautiful algebraic structure that we've used so far, and we can't do closed form inference anymore using just linear algebra. But we weren't quite willing to give up on that, so we kind of used the sledgehammer to make it be linear algebra again. And that sledgehammer turned out to be Laplace approximations. So we find the mode of this posterior. Finding this mode requires some numerical methods. And I actually, admittedly, didn't really talk much about how to use these numerical methods. Why? Because there's lots of opportunity here in Tübingen to learn about them. Maybe you've been to the deep learning class by Professor Geiger. He'll have talked about some simple stochastic optimization methods. If you really want to get like, the detailed view next term, there's going to be a lecture course by Professor Hein on optimization. And I'm pretty sure he'll talk about anything you can think of optimization, certainly much more than I can. So if you really want to know how to do this bit, I've just outsourced it to Matthias Hein next term. And, and it's a beautiful piece of you know, algorithmic thinking. It's really a rich literature to think about. But let's just say we have something that finds this f hat. Then, locally, at f hat, we can do a second order Taylor expansion of the log posterior distribution. The Taylor expansion involves a constant term, a linear term, which is hopefully 0 if we're actually at the mode, and a quadratic term. And if the logarithm is a quadratic function, that means, well, actually, if the negative logarithm is a quadratic function, then that means that the exponential of this, so the probability distribution itself, is the exponential of a negative square, and that's a Gaussian distribution. So we construct an approximate Gaussian distribution which is centered as the, at the point estimate and has an error estimate which is actually more like a sensitivity map given by the inverse of the Hessian of the loss function. And then we can work. So after that, everything is linear algebra again. And we even actually spent half a lecture on how to use this structure to build a particular optimization method, Newton optimization, which is an extreme case, which is a very sort of simultaneously very powerful, but also in its individual step quite expensive optimization algorithm. It's the, maybe the optimization algorithm that is on the extreme end of expensive individual step, but extremely informative individual step. We saw that doing this for a simple data set actually led to a massive increase in performance, drop in runtime, compared to gradient descent. So my main message there was don't use gradient descent without questioning it. 
might still be a useful thing to do quite often, but don't just use it and not think about it. Um, and it also gave us an, an, a road in to deep learning. We said, well, by, at this point, we're pretty much at deep learning. We just have a, a, a general output loss, which is just the logarithm of this likelihood. Um, and we have a prior over the unknown function, which is something with a quadratic term. So, um, and these are all things that we can do in deep learning models as well, finding modes, finding Hessians. So that actually led to a framework to construct Gaussian process posterior distributions from pretty much arbitrary uh, deep neural networks. So now we're quite close to where we are at the moment in the course, so I can speed up a little bit. We realize that we can take, we can do what we just did for Gaussian process priors with logistic likelihoods and apply it the same framework to every deep neural network. And when I say every, I mean every neural network for which you can compute gradients. And uh, that's pretty much every neural network. If you can't compute gradients, you can't do deep learning. And therefore, you can compute Hessians, at least assuming that everything is, is twice continuously differentiable. And secondly, for which the, the, this little l, the empirical risk, actually is the logarithm of a likelihood. And that is a bit of a, const of a constraint, but m most empirical risks actually fulfill this constraint. So the cross entropy loss and the L2 loss in particular, also for multi-class classification, um, are logarithms of, of uh, likelihoods, so therefore they're fine. So this works as before. We train the net, we find the optimum. At the optimum, we compute the Hessian, we invert it, we linearize the network. That's the new extra step that we now need to do because we don't have a Gaussian process prior on F anymore, but only on the weights. Um, this involves the Jacobian, and we're left with a Gaussian process that replaces the output of your neural network. It just says, instead of just this trained neural network, I know, I, I've now realized that this is a point estimate, which I can think of as the mean of a Gaussian process, and it is surrounded by this sensitivity map that I call the Laplace tangent kernel. And of course, this causes some computational questions. How expensive is it to do that? How, what kind of matrix do I actually want to build here in Psi? Probably not the full Hessian for the entire network, because if it's a bit of a network, that's not tractable. But you did some homeworks and saw that there are lots of cool approximations for these curvature, uh, curvature matrices that can actually be used in practice. So now we're really close to the, this was sort of, as we, we've, we've been down to the engine room, now we've moved out and walked over to what people do out there with like the new, new hyped up deep learning stuff and for some, found that probabilistic reasoning applies there as well. We can make it basically conform with the stuff we've done so far. So in the last two lectures, we now opened up sort of a third direction to go into, which was now that we know how to do linear algebra and how to do deep learning, what about data sets that have other kind of challenges, other kind of structures that we need to maybe think about? And one of them is temporal structure. What if you have data that comes in as a continuous stream that never ends potentially? Then we can't really use this paradigm anymore of give me the data set, I'll take it into batches, and then I'll just do gradient descent until I'm converged, and then I'm done, and then I, you know, I can do linearizations, Gaussian processes, whatever. Test and train time break. It's a new kind of structure. And we found that there is this beautiful idea that's actually already quite old, 100 years old or so, uh, or older even, um, which um, describes temporal structure in terms of a, a, a finite amount of memory that doesn't get constrained more and more by the data, but which actually evolves with the data across time. That's called a Markov chain. You've seen this graph now many times. Um, with a bunch of latent variables that are called the state, which have a description for how they change over time. That's the chain up here, the chain that changes the states. And also a description for how we observe at every point in time. Those are these observation models down here. So with these two lines, we can describe a class of models by picking different, different right-hand sides here which, as we saw, will create an algorithmic structure called filtering and smoothing that allows O of, well, O of T time inference for T observations, where each individual local update is O of one, 
and doesn't require looking further ahead into the future or into the past than the immediate neighbors. And if, again, here we have sort of, if, if we keep reusing all the stuff from deep down in the engine room, all the, all the Gaussian distributions with linear algebra, then this algorithm simplifies to something very important called the Kalman filter and the RTS smoother, which is a base class of algorithms for probabilistic inference and signal processing in dynamical systems. So with that, we now have a toolbox that you can use when you leave this lecture hall after term ends to apply to a large class, not a universal class of problems, but a large class of machine learning problems. It's fundamentally built around this mathematical insight of Bayes' theorem and the sum rule and the product rule. So whenever someone gives you an inference problem, no matter what, your first thought is, Bayes' theorem. So what do I need to do? I have to write down the probability of everything. All the variables that I get to observe and that I want to make a statement about have to go into a probability distribution. Then I have to start thinking about which parts will be computational challenges. What kind of algebraic forms do I give to these distributions P such that on the one hand, memory cost and compute cost doesn't accumulate too badly as I get more and more data, and also the individual steps of conditioning actually remain tractable. And we now found various really cool ideas, both on the modeling side and the computational side, to deal with these challenges. A knee-jerk thing to do is to try and use Gaussian distributions as much as possible and linear relationships between them. We saw that these linear relationships can be a really rich language, right? Because you're allowed to use feature functions. So you can make those connections very rich, use least squares estimation. We can also use Markov chain models, Markov, Gauss Markov models uh, for, for inference in things where, in settings where the data is infinite, where it keeps coming in as a stream. And we can use effectively the combination of autodiff and linear algebra called Laplace approximations to construct general algorithms that work on large classes of problems. And with that, it's now time for a break. And after the break, I will try to round off a little bit this toolbox by, by talking a bit about what you do with the parameters of the model that don't, really don't seem to fit into this setup. So let's continue at uh, 12 past. So I could have said that now we're done. Well, I kind of said that, right? So now we have all these cool tools, uh, all these model classes. But there are a few more elephants in the room um, which I'll try to address. And I won't actually have time to do all of them in the entire course. There'll be some things that will have to fall off at the end. Maybe I'll do at the last lecture, sort of just point in a few directions and say these are more things we could have done. And I think one question that is actually quite interesting to think about is, whether it's possible, so now on the last slide, on this one, we had lots of different model classes. But within of the, each of these model classes, there's a whole range to choose the model quite freely. So if you choose a Gaussian process, we need to decide which kernel to use and what to set the parameters of this kernel to. Remember the, ex the, the example we did in lecture 10, I think, with the CO2 curve? There were all these numbers we had to set. And if you if, if use a, a deep neural network, we had these plots, and we saw that the uncertainty has all this complicated structure. We need, maybe we would want to ask ourselves, what kind of nonlinearity do I actually want to use? How many layers should my network have? How wide should these individual layers be? So these are all questions that the previous slides didn't actually provide answers to, because they are about parameterizations of the model, which kind of, by definition, we don't want to be probabilistic about. So when we did this example with the CO2 curve, I briefly rushed past a slide like this. And I realized that it was maybe a bit too fast. So I thought today we'll use another 20 minutes to be a bit slower and think about it. So really, the abstract problem is we're going to do inference on some latent function f. This is actually the thing that we ultimately care about. We want to use it to make predictions about the world. That's the output we are interested in, the latent variable. And what we have is training data, pairs of inputs and output, y and x. And of course, we care about them because we have them. But we also don't need to worry much about them because they're just there. They sit on the hard drive. They are there. We don't question them. In, at least in probabilistic reasoning, the, the fundamental paradigm is 
the data is just given. We literally say given when we read out this vertical bar. But then there's this other thing, theta, which are these additional degrees of freedom that we could tune. And like then I had this slide that says you could sort of think about data, something called variables, and then things that are either parameters or hyperparameters. So these are the things that you don't care about, if you like. But you still need to use them to make things work. Sometimes people call them nuisance objects, nuisance parameters, things that just happen to be in your model, because otherwise you can't write it down, but you don't actually care about them. You just want the whole thing to work. You just want to set them somehow. Uh, sometimes, uh, during my PhD, I met someone who called them Stradivarius factors, because you fiddle with them. So uh, they, these are the bits that, well, you could, you could turn the sentence around instead of say, this is the bit that I don't know how to deal with. The stuff that I don't know how to deal with, I just call a parameter. Because if I would know how to deal with it, I would do one of two things. Either I would care about it. It's part of the description of the world. And then it should move into the F bit. It should become part of F. Or I don't care about it, but I know how to deal with it. And the, the knowing how to deal with it in probabilistic reasoning is integrate it out. Use the sum rule to just get rid of it. And then you never have to think about it again. But some of these parameters, we just don't know how to integrate out because the corresponding integrals are intractable. And then we have to set them somehow. So how do we do this? Well, it turns out that there is a fundamentally correct way to do this that only works on paper. And that fundamentally correct thing to do is to stare at Bayes' theorem and realize that if we are explicit about theta, then actually, well, maybe let's, let's stare at this Bayes' theorem, then we actually realize that the normalization constant of Bayes' theorem that I've so far often kind of waved away can be used to answer exactly this question about theta. So, so far, when we encountered inference problems, I always said, well, what's the right way to deal with an inference problem? Bayes' theorem. OK, so up there where the marker is, that's Bayes' theorem. We care about the unknown, the unknown thing f, the unknown function, which we want to have a Gaussian process prior over and then some data, y. And for that, we need to take a prior on f, multiply it with a likelihood for y given f, and then normalize by the evidence p of y. That's without the f. So we've integrated out f. And so first of all, there's usually this problem that the normalization constant might be tricky. But if everything is Gaussian, it's fine. It's just closed form. So we don't even talk about it. We just let it drop on the wayside. We just say, well, it's a Gaussian distribution, so it's normalized by construction, whatever. There's this thing which we don't actually have to write down because it's kind of automatically dealt with by our Gaussian library. But if you look at this and now realize that there is a model in this whole thing, a model described by those parameters theta, then those thetas show up everywhere on the right in red. They are always on the right-hand side of every conditional. The whole thing might depend on theta. I mean, maybe you're lucky and theta only shows up in the likelihood or only in the prior. But in general, it's just everywhere. And it's also in the normalization constant. And now this normalization constant, what actually is this? Well, it's a probability for the data y given theta. Also given x, but x is given. So we, it's literally given. We know what it is, so we don't have to worry about it, right? The inputs are just there. But theta, we don't know. So what this is here is a likelihood for theta. And if we had it, and in Gaussian process models we actually have it, we could use it in another instance of Bayes' theorem that says, let's take this object from up here, multiply it with a prior, normalize, and that's our posterior. In principle, that's the correct answer. It's a way to figure out what, like, what we know about theta. But I say in principle because, first of all, this object might not even be tractably computable. For Gaussian processes, it actually is. And then secondly, even if this is available, this thing down here probably isn't. Because it's another integral of more complicated structure, right? where every individual term in the integral, the integrand itself, is already an integral. So there's an integral hidden up here as well. Right? 
So it's like a double two-level integral. But in principle, this is what we'd like to do. And now we just see how far we get. So uh, by the way, so this approach to, to thinking about how to fit parameters has different names. It's sometimes called marginalization of the, li of the likelihood. Sometimes it's called type 2 marginal likelihood or type 2 maximum likelihood. Um, because maximum likelihood would be finding the f that maximizes this expression. And type 2 maximum likelihood is finding the theta that maximizes this expression, where we integrated out the f. Um, it's also, maybe more importantly, historically called the evidence framework due to a PhD thesis by David Mackay, who spent his entire like, first five years of his career dealing with this kind of question. Um, and in some cases, there is actually a closed form answer to it. So in Gaussian process regression, back in lecture 10, when we did this, experiment, this uh, CO2 curve, we realized that for Gaussian process models, if we specifically use a Gaussian process prior, then we can stare at this big slide with the, with the Gaussian math that I had a few slides ago and discover that when we multiply the Gaussian process prior for f with a Gaussian likelihood for, for y given f, to construct, we don't just actually construct a posterior. So here is our prior for the, for the weights, in this case, of a parametric function, or the prior for f, times a likelihood for y. Then we don't just get the posterior. Sorry, here it is, this one, which we've so far used for regression. But we actually also get the normalization constant, the thing that goes in the denominator of Bayes' theorem. You could just literally divide this over here, and then you'd have Bayes' theorem. And it has an explicit form. It actually is an object that is of, I will say, Gaussian form, because we can write it in this, in this form with a curved curly n. But it's a function of theta. And as a function of theta, it's not a Gaussian distribution at all. It's just something we can write down, but it depends on theta in a nonlinear fashion, because theta enters all these terms that are in there. It enters the features phi, for example. Or for Gaussian process models, it enters the mean function, the kernel, and maybe even the noise term. And now what we can't do is come up, in general, with a nice prior for theta to multiply here and then find a joint posterior, because this thing will have very complicated algebraic form in theta. But what we can do is we can find the mode of this object. We can find the mode of um, the, uh, this, this object, which is a likelihood. Right? We could also take the logarithm of that and find the mode of this log likelihood. And we could even add a prior, a log prior, um, to regularize further. So actually, there's a slide on this, which back then I went through a little bit too fast. It says, let's do this. So we look at this expression from the previous slide. That's the thing that was here. It's this green thing from over here. Um, which I will have in here, actually. So here it is again. That's the expression from before. This is the derivation for it, right? So this uh, marginal is likelihood times prior, and then you integrate out the unknown function. This is possible for Gaussian distributions in closed form. It gives us this term, which doesn't depend on f, times the posterior over f, which is a probability distribution. So if we integrate over it, it's just 1. And this is the bit we now have to deal with. So uh, we um, do what we've done so far with in the other map, maximum a posteriori type estimation problems as well. We, we say, well, we might as well maximize the logarithm of this, because the logarithm is a monotonic transformation, and so it doesn't change the location of the mode. We could also put a minus in front and minimize instead, because maximizing a function is the same as minimizing minus that function in terms of where it find its, finds its minimum. And then we just write out what this thing actually is. So this is the logarithm of a Gaussian distribution. It's the log PDF that you can also find in our Python code. And the reason to do that is to stare at it and think a bit about what we're actually doing when we optimize this object. So this, so you remember, right, the Gaussian is 1 over square root of 2 pi to the d half times the determinant of 
the covariance matrix raised to the one half times e to the minus one half quadratic term. So this is the logarithm of it. And now we've dragged in these thetas, these quantities that we might that affect our model, and we've just left them in everywhere. The first thing we see is that there is a constant term here at the end. This is just how many data points we have. And it is just involves 2 pi. So this bit we really don't have to care about because it's constant. So we can't change it by changing theta. It's just a number. So then there's two terms left. The first one actually measures how close the data is to the prediction under the prior, not the posterior, but under the prior, scaled by the inverse covariance under the prior. So this is, I said that back then a few times, this is kind of how far you are, how far the data is from what you predicted it to be under the prior, scaled by how uncertain you want to be about those, those variables. So how, how surprised, like how surprised are you when you are this far away from what you thought it would be, but this is how far you thought it would be away, squared, from each, from like this is like two things, so squared, right? Um, so that's a number that we, well, actually, what do we want that number to be? We even did a homework exercise on this. Maybe we want it not to be zero, actually, right? Because this is supposed to be a probability distribution. We want it to be one, or n, actually, the number of observations. So if we do minimization of this expression, this actually sounds a bit dangerous. Because what we could do is we could just pick mu to be exactly equal to y. And then we could set this variance to just be zero. And then that would be a very, very small number. Uh, actually, a very, uh, let's be careful with the minimum. So we could set this to something very large, right? Uh, if we can't, so if, of course, if we have a model for, for the mean that we can, it's so flexible that we can just make it equal to the data, okay, fine, then we're screwed. But even if this is, let's say, let's say this is a simple function, it's a constant function, for example, we could set this to the mean of mu, of y, and then we just scale this by some really, really, really large number, and then this whole thing will become very, very, very small. Nice. So theta could just be chosen such that this thing has very large variance. Yes. Oh, there's a bug in this slide. Okay, thanks for pointing this out. So this is sort of simultaneously, um, <laughs> okay, that's stupid. So either, uh, okay, we get to pick which one. Okay, so just, just pick one of these two. I think both of them kind of make sense on their own, but not together. So either take this one or this one. So this would be for a Gaussian process model, you just have a mean function. And for a parametric model, you just have some a bunch of features, right? Okay, uh, that's a stupid bug, yeah. But actually, I mean, the interesting bit is about the matrix in the middle. So for, typically for, for Gaussian process regression models, we don't even want to have a particularly strong parameterized mean. We just want it to be maybe even zero or just a constant, right? What we do care about is this kernel and its parameters. This is the thing that really matters. And this is where this extra term becomes relevant. So if we just wanted to do maximum type one likelihood, so if we just wanted to maximize this expression with respect to f, without computing a posterior, so just this bit, this one Gaussian in here, then we, would, we could do this by making the variance very large. Because then that term would just become very small. But since we've integrated out this uh, posterior here, we get this extra term over here. And what is this thing? Well, it's the log determinant of essentially the kernel gram matrix plus some noise. And this thing is supposed to be minimized. So if we make this very large, then we are adding something to this bit that we want to be minimal. So remember that kxx and kxx plus lambda are positive definite matrices. So this determinant is a positive number because determinants are products of our eigenvalues. If the eigenvalues are all positive, then that's a product of a positive number. So it's a positive number. So we can't make 
this thing, uh, well, if we take a logarithm of it, which might be a negative number then, right? But it's well defined. It's always possible to actually write down. And if we make this very large to make this term very small, then at some point, this start, thing starts to dominate. And there will be an optimum to choose. This observation that there is some kind of regularization emerging, even without a prior on theta, is sometimes called a penalty for model complexity, or it's called the Occam factor. You might have heard of Occam's razor. Who has heard of Occam's razor? Everyone, so you've heard of this guy. Um, he's maybe one of the, uh, like, he's, he's the, oldest, the oldest person that shows up on slides in my, in, uh, in, in my lectures. William of Occam, a, a Catholic dogmatist from the high medieval, uh, high, high Middle Ages, born in Occam, that's why he was got his name from in Surrey. He died in Munich, and there's a this street named after him in Munich. Um, Ockhamstrasse. Why? Because he had a really complicated life, but it's 1200 something, so I think for us it's pretty much impossible to understand what his life was like. Uh, he, he was a, a, one of these monks that were arguing long before the Reformation for poverty of the clerics, and he got into problems with the Pope because he was arguing too much for the Pope to be poor as well, and that's why he had to emigrate. To He left Avignon and then was excommunicated for it and had to move to Bavaria and weird, weird, it's difficult to understand from our perspective. Uh, but he also wrote some philosophical treatises and it seems that back then he was a bit like this was a time when there was this like, you know, high middle ages, lots of complicated flourishes on the thoughts of people, no math whatsoever, no order in thinking. And he tried to clean up a bit because he felt that people were just like they, just like they were becoming too Decadent and having too much money, they also became too complicated in their thinking and he wanted to clean up everything and everything to be clean and poor and restricted and uh, stoic maybe even. And so he wrote as these um, uh, treatises also on the philosophy in which he, the actual quote is a bit complicated. Here it is in Latin, which essentially means, that he said saying that you don't need several possible explanations to drag around for one thing, if you can one, find one simple explanation for it, then that should be enough. And people sort of later on, over nearly a thousand years since then, have translated this into uh, this kind of idea that we should have models that are simple, that don't have so many degrees of freedom. In particular, you can think of situations in which if it turns out that we can find one single explanation so a rank one term, a single feature that explains all of the data, y perfectly, then this is a rank one matrix and this determinant is zero. And so the logarithm of it is minus infinity, which is optimal. So if you can find descriptions of the data that don't even need noise, then that's a wonderfully perfect explanation. Of course, in reality, typically that's not gonna be possible unless we make a model too flexible, unless we choose theta, such that we can always learn a rank one decomposition of the data. Um, if we do that, then we shouldn't use this framework and we should instead put a prior on theta here to say we don't want to have classes of models that can learn everything. Um, oh, well, that can learn every finite data set because then they won't generalize in, in, uh, typically. So this does not mean, it's actually the main point, <laughs> that you don't need a prior on theta and it doesn't mean that we should choose arbitrarily complicated models uh, to, to, to describe what's going on. So this term itself does not fix the problem of, over, of overfitting. It just helps a little bit. So what we've now done in the next, in the, um, in the, 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 when we translated Gaussian, this Gaussian formalism to uh, deep learning, actually, also can be used for model learning. So what I've shown you so far are these slides from lecture 10, where we use this framework to, do, to fit Gaussian process models. And you will remember back then I had an actual piece of code that learned about 10 or 12 different parameters, length scales and output scales of different physical processes in the CO2 curve. And since then, we've moved on. We've decided to use Gaussian distributions everywhere else. 
in uh, deep neural networks, for example. And it turns out that you can actually use the exact same framework there as well. You just halfway through inject the Laplace approximation to make everything Gaussian again. So here's how this works. Let's say we have a general P of Y given F. So for example, it could be a sigmoid uh, uh, likelihood or a logistic loss function or a, a, sorry, cross entropy loss and some prior over F. In particular, it could be a Gaussian prior, but actually what we're going to do works even if the prior is not Gaussian. Then we do Laplace. So we find the mode of this expression with respect to F. Let's call that mode F star. We find it by uh, taking the maximum of the logarithm of the posterior and then do a local Taylor expansion. So we compute our Hessian again. Then we get our um, local approximate quadratic expansion in the log space. So P of Y given theta is the integral over prior times likelihood. So prior times likelihood is up to second order, this expression raised to like e to the this. Okay? And now um, we realize that we treat f star as a constant. So everything that only depends on f star can actually move outside of the integral. So this bit does not depend on f because f is fixed, clamped to be f star. And here, f is fixed to be f star. So we can take those out of the integral and of course we combine the exp and the log to just get prior times likelihood. And what we're left with is just an integral over a quadratic form. So that integral is just this, it's a Gaussian it's a Gaussian integral, right? There's a two pi showing up with the dimensionality and then importantly, the log determinant of psi. And this is now an expression that we can actually optimize for parameters. So both F star and psi will depend on parameters and we can tune them and just keep doing this integral, which isn't actually an integral, right? It's just an, it's sort of translated integrals into uh, differentiation into second order expansions. In particular, also, as a side note, if P of F, the prior, is actually a Gaussian distribution, then we can simplify things a little bit further. So then we know that P of F will be a Gaussian form, and then, um, so then this bit here will become particularly easy, and we're just left with the logarithm of this, um, and then a quadratic form, um, uh, and this entire expression can, can then be written more succinctly like this where this is the, like, the working piece, the, the, the log likelihood, minus a quadratic term, minus a combination of both the Hessian of the loss and the Hessian of the prior, which is just K inverse. And uh, we saw me briefly use this matrix B in the Gaussian process classification, so this is a way to uh, do this particularly efficiently. So this is actually a very general way of finding good models. You, you, I give you any model, as long as it's twice continuously differentiable, and I can think of the loss function as an actual log likelihood, I can always do this. I can just let it run. I need to move to the final slide. And So you can do this on pretty much any model you can write down, including a deep neural network. The only price you're paying for it is, how do you tune this thing then? Well, with an optimizer, somehow. So you need to compute a gradient of this expression with respect to the parameters that you're trying to optimize. So those parameters might, parameters might show up in K and in B, in W, um, in here as well, depending on what you want to optimize. And maybe those parameters are even discrete, then it's a bit more difficult to do this optimization. But it's a general framework. But I don't want to end here. I actually want to introduce one more little algorithmic trick that will lead us into the last two or three lectures that we're going to discuss, which can sometimes be applied, 
And when it can be applied, it's very powerful. Similar to how, oh, I just realized I forgot to upload the slides, right? So no one has told me to put them on, on Elias. Okay, they'll be on Elias in five minutes. Um, and do you remember, remember when, we did G, when we did GP classification? We had a similar situation where we first talked about gradient descent and said, like, oh, okay, I really don't know how to optimize this thing. I'm just going to create a gradient and follow the gradient. And then later we realized, oh, actually, we can get the Hessian in nice closed form, numerically stable. Maybe we can do Newton optimization. And then it took us a bit of time to do that, but when we had it done, it worked so much better than gradient descent. It went like a thousand times faster and just converged all the time. So here's a similar situation that in general, we would like to do this thing. We would like to compute the marginal evidence or log evidence and optimize it. What is this thing? Well, it's the logarithm of a big integral over a bunch of quantities. Oh, I should introduce what those quantities is. For the, for the, the case of this slide, um, I'm assuming there is a model that has parameters theta, observed data y, and I've now replaced the latent variables to just be called z because f is a bit too suggestive of regression. And for regression, we now know how to do it, but z could be anything. Then this is the thing you would like to do. You want to get rid of all the variables you don't know and then optimize for theta. And we realized that we can do this in principle with Laplace, which is always possible, but then we are faced with a complicated optimization problem. So there is a particular structure that is, turns out to be surprisingly useful, which we're going to study over the next, certainly th on Thursday, entire next lecture, um, but maybe even longer after that, which you also need for this week's homework. So I want to spend these, these three lines in five minutes and um, to make sure you understand what the idea is. And it's the following. It says, instead of trying to compute this thing, which you don't know how to compute in closed form, and instead of approximating it with a quadratic term, which is then just an approximation, so it might be wrong, instead, See if you can evaluate this expression. And this expression, at the moment, just falls from the skies. You just have to, assume, uh, just have to believe me that this is an interesting thing to compute. And this is a, the problem with this algorithm, that everyone who has to teach it has to decide to either spend two lectures doing some complicated theory that no one understands before you get to the actual algorithm, or to just show you an algorithm that you don't understand why it's useful, but maybe you can understand what the computation is. So that's the thing I do now. Let's see. So what we're going to compute is the expected value. So this is an integral over a probability distribution against the function. That's an expected value. The expected value of the logarithm of the joint. So notice how the difference between up here and down here is that the logarithm is now inside of the integral, not outside. That's a different thing, because the logarithm is a nonlinear function. You cannot just drag it in and out of the integral willy-nilly. But if you put it in here and then take the expected value against the posterior distribution that would arise from the model with a particular choice of parameter, theta star. In some cases, and we'll find a few, these posteriors can actually be computed. And these logarithms of the joint actually are relatively easy algebraic expressions. For example, if this is a joint Gaussian, then this is a quadratic function. And if this posterior is a Gaussian, then the integral of a Gaussian against the quadratic form is a closed form expression. It's another thing that you can find on slides about Gaussians. And then what you do is you maximize this expression with respect to this theta. So we keep this theta star fixed and we maximize it with respect to theta. For example, we compute a gradient of this expression with respect to theta and then just take a single step. And because, and then you keep doing this, right? So you update theta, that gives you a new form for this expression. Now you have a new theta star, then you optimize again in theta, and then you get a new expression of this form. So this process iterates between computing this Q and maximizing it. This Q is an expectation. So therefore, this algorithm is called expectation maximization. EM. Who has heard of EM? Ah, now, OK, easy, good. So here is EM again. Have you seen it like this? Or have you seen it in a particular application? No? Uh, nobody knows. OK, 
Tell me, tell me on, the, on, on, on the feedback, otherwise I might tell you something next Thursday that you already know. So here's the algorithm again. It's just rewritten. Keep going between computing this expectation and maximizing it. And why is this a useful thing to do? Why would you even want to do this? Well, we need two pieces of insight to understand why this is a useful thing to do. And we'll only do the first one now and then the more important one on Thursday. The first one is to understand why this is even something you can do and why it can be you know, fun to do that kind of math. And the other one is why it's a useful thing to do. In which sense is this a correct algorithm to use? And we'll need to do this on Thursday. So for, and to, to, to answer the first question, why, this is, why you can even do this? Why is this fun to do? Why, what, what does this give me? We'll look at Gauss-Markov models. And your homework will be exactly this, actually. And someone asked me during the break, so in LTI models, in these linear time invariant models where I do Kalman filtering and smoothing, how would I know how to set those parameters of the linear time invariant system, these magic matrices called A and Q and H and R? How do I set those? Well, you set them with the M. And here's how. So remember that for our Gauss-Markov model, we made the assumption that the model consists of, these, of this nice factorization into the chain x of t given x of t minus 1 for all times t, that's this bit, initialized at, at t0, and then locally an observation y of t given x of t. And theta now are actually those matrices. It's exactly the things that we need to describe our linear time invariant system. So here they are. I've just plugged them in. Right? So everything is Gaussian with initial means and covariances and then linear maps between the x's with Gaussian noise with q and linear observations y with Gaussian noise r. So here is why it's useful to have an algorithm that computes and operates on the logarithm of this expression. If you take the logarithm of a product of Gaussians, you get a big sum over log Gaussians. And log Gaussians are quadratic functions. So this is now a sum over squares. Ah, and sums of squares are somehow easy. So what you now, what's now left to do, and that's actually your homework, so I'll just tell you what you need to do, is you take this expression, you write it out explicitly as you know, the logarithm of a Gaussian, so there will be quadratic forms, something like xt minus a xt minus 1, transpose times q inverse times and so on. And now what the algorithm says for maximization is to compute the expected value of this expression against the posterior over x. So what's that posterior? Well, it's this product of Gaussian distribution, actually not product, it's this, yeah, it's this factorizing structure of Gaussian distributions which involved a smoother mean and covariance that Nathaniel told you about as well, MS and PS. And they're all Gaussian. It's just a product of Gaussians with MS and PS as means and uh, uh, covariances. And then you need to know one trick, which is that for Gaussians, it's possible to compute the expected value against the Gaussian of a quadratic form. So here's a general quadratic form, some inner product of a linear map of x against some shift and uh, scale, against the Gaussian with mean m and variance v. And it happens to be this thing. So that's the quadratic form evaluated at the mean plus the trace of a linear map of the, the quadratic forms quantities against the variance v. And you just write it down. It's just plugging everything in. And that gives you an expression that involves a and q and h and r. And actually, we give you that expression to make it easier. And now what you're left to do is just take the derivative with respect to a and q and see what you get. And it'll be an interesting update that just allows you in closed form to say what a and q is. So with that, I'm at the end. Today, we summarized a lot. And then we realized that one thing is still missing. We need to think about how to fit models.
How do we fit models? Well, in general, you would like to compute the evidence and maximize it. But computing the evidence can be hard. So you can do Laplace, but Laplace is a fundamentally an approximation. It's local. It's not actually the exact integral. It's just an approximation. So if it works, it's good. But if it doesn't work, we can't be sure why. So instead, we looked at this other algorithm called the M, which most of you have already heard about, which we'll talk again about on Thursday, which gives an algorithm where the, the integrals we need to compute tend to be a bit easier. They're still integrals, but they tend to be easier. And in special cases like linear time invariant systems and also mixture models, which I might talk about on Thursday, actually this integral is closed form. And it gives very neat, efficient updates. So please leave feedback and tell me how much you know about EM so that I have an idea of what to do on Thursday. <laughs>